All right, so just uh, we got our welcoming slide up there right now, and uh, hopefully, if you can't hear me, obviously, that you would need to call in on the phone. So I might as well save my breath because obviously you're not going to be able to hear me. Uh, make sure that your viewing is set to 1280 by 1024 or higher. Uh, that's going to help you see. That way you don't have to screen all over or scroll all over your screen so you can see the full picture. And if there's any questions, um, if you're losing connectivity or something like that you can go ahead and try our 800 number there for any kind of technical issues so let's go ahead and get up and running tail uh, um, everybody I'm gonna mute everybody so I don't get the feedback and we don't hear it we're actually gonna record this so this will be available after we're finished we're gonna get this up on the website as soon as possible so hang on just a second all callers are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. All right. Well, welcome, welcome. Um, today is our first in our series of Revit MEP. Uh, we're calling it the ABCs of Revit MEP. And Teo and I, uh, we went round and round for that name, didn't we, Teo? <laughs> yeah. So we're so pleased about that. And uh, completely unrelated, both of us came in today wearing velvet black jackets. So we're the Velvet Brothers today. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, welcome, and let's go ahead and uh, get rolling on this. So we always like to goof off a little bit. Um, I am Kevin Claussen. I'm the Software Applications Manager. I had to throw in the picture there. I hear it all the time that I look like Spicoli. Uh, and there's Teo right underneath there. Um, and Teo has joined us recently. Uh, he's from the industry. And I just want to say real quick, he's done an absolutely wonderful job for us. So some of you have already met him. In fact, many of you have met him. Um, in some of our shows that we'll be doing in the real near future here, some test drives and that, I, I highly recommend you come on up, say hi. Uh, he's just done a fantastic job for us. He's one of our new rock stars. Uh, he and I have been working on this webcast here, and he's put a lot of effort into it. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. Um, this is basically sort of the building blocks. We're, we're starting out from the beginning, sort of the foundation. So for those of you that are just getting up to speed with, with um, Revit and Revit MEP, uh, you're in the right place. Uh, hopefully we're not going to be preaching to the choir for too many of you folks uh, if you're a little bit more advanced, but today is really just getting you up and running, just getting a feel uh, and a taste for this program. So a couple of quick things um, about the PPI group, just so you know who is talking if you haven't had a chance to, to um, come to any of our shows. Uh, we are a locally owned company. Uh, we've been around forever. Uh, we've been around since 1927, and we've been in the industry, in the software industry, for 26 years. Uh, in fact, we're the longest uninterrupted Autodesk reseller in the Pacific Northwest, and we're quite proud of that. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these things, but I do want to point out a couple quick ones. Uh, we have the largest training center. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we, deal, we work hand-in-hand -hand with Autodesk, and Autodesk has actually told me on many occasions that we have the nicest training facilities uh, west of the Mississippi. Uh, very, very large and, you know, all top of the line. Uh, a couple other things that we do offer, and I know Teo's out in the, the field doing this constantly, uh, we do full consulting and implementation. So if you're one of the firms that, that is uh, logging in today just to kind of get the, the taste of Revit, um, we'd be more than happy to help you out. Uh, we're working with government agencies. We're working across the board, really, uh, with everybody, and we'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, we, we offer full implementation services, and that's completely scalable. So, I mean, everything from just setting up your plotter to how, how is your firm actually going to switch over to Revit uh, coming from whatever program that it is that you're coming from. So uh, we'd be more than happy to do that. Just give us a call, and we'll provide those phone numbers later for you. Uh, real quick, too, just to, to let you know, uh, we offer um, tech support. And, I, and I, in fact, I know I, I walk by Teo's Cube quite a bit, and he's on the phone uh, pounding out uh, resolutions to problems there. Uh, I just wanted to also point out that our technical support is in Portland and in Seattle. Uh, we are local. We're truly local. We're not farming this out overseas. Uh, it, when, when you call in for tech support, you're going to get one of us, and we're going to be the same people that come out there and hopefully help you uh, with you know, your implementation and or you know, get you up and running, whatever it may be. So 
you know, feel free to give us a call. We'll, we'll get that information there later as well. Go ahead. So on today's agenda, and this is Teo Phil, if or Teo for short, if uh, some of you might recognize my voice. Um, so today's agenda, like Kevin was saying, this is just the the breaking ground. This is just the uh, laying down of the foundation, the very very basics of Revit and uh, Revit MVP. So today, what we're going to be looking at, just a quick uh, info on BIM and what that is, building information modeling, uh, history on Revit MEP. Uh, we're going to be looking at the new software and how it looks and we're going to break that down for you uh, piece by piece and we're going to go through that then we're going to switch over to our actual uh, live presentation of the software and we're going to go ahead and show you how to work with an architectural model uh, how do you open it how do you browse in and look for, through there and also obviously about the project browser what that is and uh, how to use it going to be looking at uh, creating some views and more specifically we're going to create a section and how to use that to your uh, ability to explore the model and the project that you are working on. We're going to also look at the navigating in 3D view and some quick tips here and there to be able to look at your project in a three-dimensional uh, view. And last we're going to look at the way that we print. Uh, if you're looking at being the project manager and uh, you just received your architectural model and you want to get your team up and running one one of the things that you might want to do is end up printing all the views or all the sheets that the architect has for this project so we're going to cover that and show you how to print and how to batch print uh, real quick uh, this is Kevin again I just want to jump in um, you'll notice at the top of your screen there's a Q&A uh, anytime during this process if there's uh, a question that you have, you, you're more than, uh, Teo's pointing it out right now, go ahead and go right into there. I'll be checking those and answering questions as best I can. Um, if it pertains to the, the webcast, we'll probably go ahead and just bring them out and kind of share it with everybody. So feel free to do that. Um, I, was there anything else? And we'll, we'll have a Q&A time at the end, so feel free to make notes and um, we'll unmute everybody and ask questions if you guys have any, okay? So here we go. So BIM uh, or building information modeling. I, I think that a lot of you have heard the, the phrase BIM and uh, always wonder what it is. And uh, it's an integrated process to uh, be able to put together your project that is from the architect. From the architect right here, you can actually develop your model with intelligent uh, walls uh, and structure to it and then it moves down to the same model goes over to the civil engineer where he introduced it to a site plan and from there they send it over to the structural the structural engineer puts in all the structural components that are intelligent and know and communicate with the same model that the architect started from there we take it over to the MEP engineers and they add all their ductwork pipes and such and electrical components that are all intelligent once again and continue developing this one model. From there, it finally gets kicked over to the builders where the builders can actually coordinate all the information in there in three-dimensional real-life uh, size models and are able to do cost analysis, they'll be able to uh, make sure that everything works as we engineered and designed it to. And once it's built, the owner can at then uh, take that same model and bring it into their software that they use to manage the building and use that to be able to uh, run the facilities and such. So it's a process where intelligent 3D modeling happens across the board through all disciplines from the beginning all the way to the uh, end and to the life of the building. Quick history on uh, the Revit MEP, and some of you have seen this if you've been in my class. It's a slide that I like to introduce to everybody to give them a little more uh, understanding of the background of Revit, and uh, more specifically for us MEP guys, for the MEP guys. So Revit MEP started with uh, Revit Technology Corporation, and they've uh, had about uh, nine updates, as you can notice in the parentheses over here, until 2002 when Autodesk acquired Revit Technologies and this was at this point just uh, Revit was intended for architects 
So that, that's important to understand. And when Autodesk purchased it, they purchased it with the architectural intent software. So that was great, and it's a beautiful, powerful software. And Autodesk noticed the other possible capabilities such as structure and MEP. And that's where after 12 more revisions here, you notice that 22 revisions of this software, they started uh, to also incorporate the structural in 2005, and then uh, they've updated this all the way until uh, 2009, obviously. And they have about six versions of the structural. And then MEP came through, and they actually have about four updates, and they're working on their fifth update for Revit MEP. So those of you that have uh, started with Revit Systems 1 uh, back in 2006, you'll, you, I think, would agree with me that it's jump uh, light light years ahead compared to what it started with and it's getting only better and faster but um, a lot of a lot of the technology behind Revit is backed by a long history of updates and uh, and such and it's only gonna get better and better so I strongly recommend it because it's it's a powerful software so the new software and look this is Revit and this is um, definitely different from AutoCAD and one thing you'll notice is it's got a white background. You can change that if you wanted to and uh, make it look a little different. But other than that, there's no customizing of the buttons and uh, having fun uh, as far as like in AutoCAD where you can customize until you're blue in the face. But this is straight up, this is what it is and uh, what it looks like. We have the pull down menu that are pretty close to the same as you're used to, the file, edit and uh, you have tools, settings, window, and then there's some modeling and drafting that are more Revit specific pull down menus. The toolbars available are uh, pretty much the same but except for obviously the Revit tools you have your new open save print and uh, some 3D modeling and 3D view or view options and uh, some additional drafting tools such as split, trim, offset and such those are up here and additional options such as move copy you notice that those are grayed out because uh, right now we're not in the middle of a command and we'll talk about that in a little bit the design bar is where all the work happens is where you select your tools for uh, drafting or should I say modeling not drafting your piping ductwork and such and that's located right here the option bar is just below the toolbars and above uh, the project browser and the design bar and this is the uh, the place where you select your different type of equipment or you have options for the equipment that's already in your model. The project browser is uh, located right here as well and this is where all of your all of your views and work happens to be located in and organized in and we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit and then you have the drawing area is where you place all of your work and your modeling the status bar at the bottom is uh, this is the closest to, uh, thing to a command line where you can actually receive a little message, error message or instruction message whenever you're in the process of doing something. So you want to keep an eye on, on the bottom left of your uh, software to be able to see what's going on or what is it it's expecting you to do next as you're trying to model. Also right next to it you have the view bar and this is where you uh, verify what scale factor you're in and where you can change the scale factor. Uh, the quality of your view such as coarse, medium or fine detail and shading and such and other view options in here. The workflow that you want to develop and this is a good habit that uh, I would highly recommend if you're using Revit is to start with the design bar such as you start with the air terminal like we have in this image and then you move up to the option bar and make sure that you have the options set correctly and such as the right diffuser, uh, the whether you want it to be tagged or not and then finally third you put in the actual diffuser so developing this habit will actually prevent a lot of errors and headaches uh, over the course of your modeling in Revit and I say modeling because I, I believe that um, we're not drafting anymore we're actually modeling 
So let's go ahead and uh, switch it over to our Revit and we're going to walk through the process of opening and dealing with the architectural model. So this is Revit MEP and uh, this is the greeting window. Right here is just a list of projects that have uh, previously been working on. Then uh, families that I've also been working on just recently having fun with. And um, this is always going to be open for you. You can always just close this window there. That way you don't have to see it well, in this particular session of Revit. So to open, we can always just go ahead and click on the open button or use the control O to open or just go to the file open pull down menu. Here I'm going to just go ahead and um, browse to where my architectural model is. So depending on your project, this could be located on the server or on your hard drive. And I'm going to just go ahead and select this Revit building. And one thing that we want to do before we run and uh, hit open or double click on it, we want to make sure that we click on the detach from central button right here. About 80% to 90% of uh, architectural projects, if not almost 99%, um, are going to be a, a project that is using work sets, meaning more than one person at a time can work on that particular project. So um, what that happens uh, to be is anytime that you receive a copy from the architect, what happens is that if you want to open it, you have to detach in order to allow you to make any changes because it will continue to try to save back to the central file. So this warning right here just lets us know that from now on, if I do detach from central this file, I will not be able to save back to the original architectural file, and we don't intend to do that. So we're going to go ahead and click OK on that. Now that we clicked OK, we're going to go ahead and click Open. So click Open. And as this thing's opening, one error that I'm going to pop up here is this one that says the work sharing has not been enabled for that file. So detach from central option was ignored and that's a good thing. So looks like for this particular project or that particular model, uh, the architect did not have work sharing on. So we're going to go ahead and click OK. Nothing really happened. So now that we have this project open, as you can see, the project browser is right here, and let's talk about that right now, just so that we get a little more comfortable with it. So the project browser is uh, always going to be located here, unless you decide to move it, or as some people do, is they actually click on this little X right here by accident. It's happened even to me a few times, and uh, some people may freak out, and how do I get that back? I want to get that back. Well, you just go ahead and move your cursor over here to the browser button and you just go ahead and click on that and that brings that back for you. Also if you wanted to uncheck it of course you click that same button and it goes away as well in case you wanted to have more drawing area so you can actually see more of your model and be able to work especially if you're going to be in one view for a long time and such. I like to have a lot of views so that allows me to do that but I'm going to bring this back right here Another thing I can do with the project browser, I can drag it, of course, from here and allow me to see the longer title sheets that are in this project. I can also click and hold and drag that. And what I'm doing is click and holding it from here, and I can drag that so that it's freestanding like this. And if I have a second monitor, I can drag this over to my second monitor and uh, have that available there and be able to have a little more working space for me. Of course, I can also move it up at the top if I wanted to, like such. Of course, that really gives me very little room to work with, so I'm not a big fan of that one. I, I tell you, um, if, for those of you that haven't switched over to a dual monitor, um, once you do, you can never go back. That's right. And as a matter of fact, Teo is trying to get himself three at the moment. <laughs> My laptop won't support it and uh, we can just move it back so you have a little bit of flexibility with this uh, project browser. Now in the project browser it is just what that it, it, the title says which is whatever is in the project is what you're looking at so if it's in your project you're going to be able to look for it using the project browser. So in here we have views and then more specifically we have uh, subcategories of views and that we have floor plans, ceiling plans in here, we have uh, 3D views, elevations, 
you notice that there's different types of elevations, interior and uh, exterior, which are building elevations. And we also have a few sections in this project as well. So every time that I do open an architectural model, I always like to take the time to really get to know it, to get to know my project and see what the architect has going in here. Now this particular model that I've opened here is actually one that's pretty clean. I've seen some additional architectural models that you get and you'll have uh, probably over 200 views in here. Right now you only have probably, gosh, only about 20 views or so. So this is actually a very clean example. So we have views in our project browser. What, uh, we also have the, our legends in here and currently we have no legends. We also have schedules in here or quantity takeoffs of uh, items in our project if we create any. We also have the sheets in this project and uh, in here it looks like we have about eight sheets created for us and these are the architectural sheets. And as I open these plus marks right here, I get to see exactly what view is in here. And if you notice this right here, floor plan level one is actually the view up here, which is this one right here. Another thing you want to notice is the fact that the view that I have currently open right now is bold indicated in my project browsers, such as the site plan. So right now I'm actually in the site plan. If I wanted to double click, um, if I wanted to view a sheet, I just want to double click on this sheet right here, and it'll take me straight to that view. So here's our sheet, and this is our view right here that uh, is assigned to this particular sheet. And that view is exactly the same view. If I was to double click here or up there, it opens the same exact view, which is the first floor plan. It's so level one right here. So I'm looking at level one and kind of exploring to see what do we have in this project. Some of you may want to print this out and look at it, but I, I'm a 3D kind of guy. So that's a good way to also save paper if you want to be green, right? To just view it electronically versus printing the whole set. But I can understand some people like to have the paper in their hands. So we have sheets in our project. The other thing that we have here is families. And for those of you that are new to Revit, families are another way to refer to as the blocks in your project. And um, they're not just blocks, they're very intelligent blocks that are uh, very uh, aware of what it is and what it's supposed to have a relationship with. Uh, it's a parametric type of um, uh, block. It's very intelligent. So this particular project, which is the architectural project, as you can see, we have annotation symbols in here, and those are architectural. Also, we have uh, ceilings, curtain panels. We have floors, doors, roofs, walls. So this is all architectural, and uh, we don't have any ductwork or mechanical equipment or electrical components here. So obviously, uh, if we had that in our project, we will see it here. And we're going to look at an example of that in a little bit. So all the families are located in here. And if you ever wanted to see what blocks you're using or what uh, term unit family uh, block you're using, you can always just go ahead and look for it and browse in your families in your project browser. The other thing we have here is groups. If you create groups of, um, let's say, an apartment and uh, be able to track those and see which ones you have in your uh, in your model that's the place to go and also this is a, a list of all the Revit links that you may have in your project as well so that's all the project browser content that we have available for us that's a pretty simple uh, way to just view and get to know your project now that we've looked and noticed that uh, what the architect has done it for this project we can now go ahead and do a little more exp uh, exploring by creating some sections. So I'm in level one right now, so floor plan level one, and notice that there are some sections right now in here already assigned for me. Now I can look for those sections and see which one is the one that I'm actually interested in, or I can go ahead and create my own. So looks like this section right here cutting across the whole entire project is pretty good. 
and I would like to go ahead and activate that or go to that section. To do that, I can double click on this section head or I can right click on it and say go to view. And that will take me directly to that section of the building. Once I'm in here, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in and you've noticed that it's we have the site plan in here and a lot of information. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in there. To do that, I'm going to use my zoom tool right here at the top. And this is a window type zoom, so I'm just going to click and hold at the top corner and bring it down to the bottom and let go and it's going to zoom within that view for me. So some of you notice that there's some kind of shadow going on here and that is correct. If we look down at our properties bar and uh, we look at our view properties down here, we'll notice that we have a few options here such as this one for shadows and it looks like it's on right now. So to turn that off because I'm not interested in the shadow, light sh uh, shadow right now, so I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. Notice that that cleaned up the model really quick for me and made it nice and it's going to allow me to zoom in and out actually a lot faster to be able to explore this. Also what else I can do is go ahead and change the way this looks if I'm not interested in the colors. I can go to just hidden wireframe, wire mode. And now I, I just see this the way that I'm used to it, just simple black and white lines of this building. I can also bump up the quality in here if I want to see a little more thickness in the walls and whatnot. Medium is usually a good uh, quality setting and I like hidden. I think that that's a pretty clean way to do it but if you want to be able to see the walls and doors colored beautifully in the glass by all means go for it. Why not? We have that available. So right now looking here in this building section I noticed that this particular room has no ceiling and level floor uh, first floor plan. This is my second floor plan right here and the way that I know that I'm looking at these level lines and if I wanted to just do a quick info or just check on this I could just select this particular ceiling plan. If I zoom in here I can select it and it gives me different dimensions of this. So particular this dimension right now all I did is just select that ceiling and this automatic dimension pops up for me to just to let me know and I can just go ahead and click on this right here to make this dimension a permanent dimension. So now I know what what elevation that ceiling is at. What I can also do is go to my drafting tools on from my design bar and here I can select the dimension tool and I can dimension the bottom of this floor to the top of the ceiling to give me a dimension of how much space I have to work with and I can let my designers or engineers know that's our ceiling space available. That's what we got to design around. If I don't like the size of this text right here because it's a little too big and whatnot, for a scale uh, for a section I typically like to use a quarter scale. So to do that I just go down to my uh, view option bar at the bottom and click on the 8 scale and that pops up a list of available scale factors I can switch to. To click it I just go ahead and select the quarter scale view. Now it does a zoom extents for me and that's okay. I can just zoom back in there with my zoom tool I, I, I zoomed in a little too small of a box, but here we go. So all I'm doing is scrolling with my mouse to zoom into the area that I'm interested in. So now I, I have this text that's a little more, a little smaller and a little more uh, clean for me to work with. So you can always move the dimensions, of course, by just selecting it and dragging them around. I can also dimension this up here as well. So I'm going back to my design bar, select on dimensions. I'm going to click on the bottom of that ceiling and the top of the floor. Looks like this is also an 8 foot. And then the top of ceiling and bottom of structure. 
looks like a three foot nine and three quarters of an inch available for me to work in there. So now I understand a little more about my building. And as I'm panning through here, I notice that I have some other ceilings here as well. And they look to be about the same level. So that gives me a good, good understanding of what I'm going to be designing this around and seeing how much I have available in this building. Now, this is a good section, but I might want to create a section that I really want to focus in on some particular part of the building. So to do that, well, first, you notice that we've been opening views and sheets all the time. One thing you want to make a habit of doing is going to your Windows pull-down menu. And from here, you notice that we have a few, the few views that we've opened. And in Revit, the more views you have open at the same time, it, it will slow down uh, over time, depending on the project as well. But you want to make a habit of always closing down your hidden windows because all of those windows are actually regenning and they're updating as you make changes to the model. So that information is hiding in the background there. It has that, to recalculate that. That's right. It's calculating and it's updating that as I make changes. So it's good to always close those down. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, select close hidden windows, meaning all the windows that are running in the background are going to be closed except for my current active view. So I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and click that. And now if I go back to my window, you notice that all I have is this particular view open. And I don't know how many of you have noticed this, but the current view that I am in is also listed at the top of the program. So right here at the top, it says that we have uh, Revit MEP 2009 and then the actual project, which is Revit Building. That's the project model. And then the section and section one is the current view that I am in. So it always lets you know where uh, you are, even though you don't have it in your project browser. Let's say your project browser was closed right here and you just don't know what view you're in. This information at the top right here gives us that ability to know exactly where you are. So let's go ahead and jump back to our level one floor plan. So I'm going to go ahead and open up my views and double click on level one. That brings my level one up. So I have quite a few sections here, but I'm going to create one and show you guys how to do that. So to create a section, what we're going to do is go ahead to our design bar on the left, and we're going to click on View. Yep, the View is the only one that has it. So we're going to go ahead and click on View section right here, and we're going to create a section. And remember what I said, you want to pay attention to and start a workflow uh, from the design bar to the option bar. So we want to pay attention up here and see what the options are for us. So I have an option of different types of section. I can do a detail section or a building section. So right now I would like a building section so I'm happy with that. The other thing I have here available for me to choose is the scale factor. So I don't have to go back and after creating the actual section I don't have to re change the scale factor. I can just go ahead right here and change that to quarter scale and if I want to have any offsets and such I can do that right here but looks like I'm ready to go so all I'm gonna do is in my drawing view I'm gonna zoom in here to see where I want this section to be and I'm gonna go ahead and just click once here and then drag my mouse across and you notice that it actually snaps at certain degrees if I wanted to or actually snaps to the building as well if you have a, a um, different angle, angle geometry of a building or, or walls that are a little bit different. It actually does follow those. So I'm just dragging this out here and I'm going to drag it all the way to this point and go ahead and click. I don't know how many of you paid attention but I used to have about eight uh, I used to have seven sections, now I have eight sections in this project right now. So let's undo that really quick and I'll show you this in real time once more. So I'm going to create a section. Notice that my project browser was automatically updated as I und uh, undoed, undid that section creation. So I'm going to select the section once again and go ahead and click here. And pay attention down here on the project browser. I'm going to go ahead and click here. And notice section 8 is automatically my project browser. So this is a view already available for me to go to town on and check it out. 
one of the things about sections I want to talk to you about was the fact that after I place it in, I have some options available as to the way that this section looks. So one of the options here is for me to flip the way that the head of the section looks or not to have a head, to have the line or head. And available on this other side over here as well, I can switch between no line or a head. And I can have heads on both sides right here. So if that's your standard as far as the way you show sections, that's available for us. The other thing available is also the flip option. Right here I can click on this button and it actually flips the section so that it looks the opposite way. And I can flip back and forth and that view is automatically updated of course. The other thing I can do here with this section callout, I can also click on this split command. And this allows me to split the line so that it doesn't cut through a bunch of pipes or mechanical room if you have a busy mechanical room. And I can just bring those back and just for, for, for uh, the graphics looks of this section, I can just split that across and have some control for that. Also, some of you have noticed this blue line, hidden line right here or uh, cyan as some people may call it. <laughs> well, this particular thing, I have these triangles right here that I can click and hold and drag about and I control how deep my section is going to cut through this building. So to show you this a little better, what I'm going to do is go ahead and close all hidden windows. I'm going to do a side-by-side -side window here and I'm going to go ahead and right-click on this view I'm going to go ahead to view and I'm going to open that up right now. And I'm going to tile these two views so that I can see them both at the same time in my view. Now I'm going to close my project browser. Because I'm using such a low resolution window, it's hard for me to really see everything and should be able to share with you all the details here. So I'm going to close that project browser and I'm going to go ahead and hit tile again. Now you can see this a little better as I'm going to update this section. So all I have to do to go back to editing this section, I just have to select it. And I don't know if you noticed, but right away when I selected this section, in the actual view, the section view, you notice this boundary right here that is selected as well. And that's because it's instant changes and it's instant modeling throughout the whole process. Whatever I do in one view instantaneously happens in another view that I have open or would, uh, would open next time and be able to see the changes instantly. So right now I can grab that and just drag that a little further if I want to see more of the building. You noticed how more information was available for me. Or I can cut back to only see so far because I might be interested in only those particular areas right now. So I'm going to drag that out to here. I can also grab the other triangles on the right or left and I can take this one and drag it as well in to the point that I want this section to cut. If I only wanted to look at the building and not, uh, not this other portion of the project. But I can drag it back and forth and bring that in. Once again, the flip command, if I flip that around, it instantly happens in my section as well. So you can always explore and use this section to do that. The other thing I can do is take this section, click and hold, and drag this section to wherever I want it to be as well. And it updates automatically for me. Of course, I can also rotate this section. If I wanted to go this way, Now this section is going to cut across the building this way. So I did undid that for us to be able to just look forward. So that's, that's a quick way to explore the building and really get to know your ceiling space for your project and uh, be really a little more comfortable as to what the architect's building looks like. Now that we've looked at this in a section, Let's go ahead and look this in a 3D view. To go to the 3D view, we can click here on the 3D button up at the top from our buttons and 
That takes us to our default 3D view. So this is an architectural 3D view. Now we just double clicked on the window to make it our primary. To do zoom extents, you just type in ZE for zoom extents. It's a quick way to. Now I'm going to go ahead and close all the hidden windows once again. Now I can go ahead and zoom in here and look at my model this way with the side plan on and everything. And I can orbit around this building by holding down shift and right click. I can just orbit around this building to check out the way it looks and how much glass I can see now how much glass I'm dealing with really quick. Also I have the 3D view cube that allows me to jump to any particular angle of this particular model so I can click on this corner right here and it takes me to that particular angle. Now you notice that the zoom extents of this particular project right now is a little too big because it encompasses the site plan as well. So what we're going to do is going to show you how to cut out some of the extra stuff to be able to see exactly what we want to see, which is the, the building at this point. So to do that, what we're going to do is go ahead and type in VV, which is a short key for the visibility graphics. And in here, this is where we can actually control what's in our project turned on right now. Now, as you can see, the list of items available are NEP content, such as the plumbing, electrical, and the uh, ductwork and such. In order to be able to see the architectural stuff and content, I want to go ahead and click on show all categories and all disciplines right here so that I can actually see the architectural set, uh, elements such as a site plan. I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that so I don't want to see the site plan at this point. Also, what I want to do is turn on a section box. Now, I know this because I've done this uh, quite a few times but I'm going to go to the annotation category and make sure that my section box is turned on. So it looks like my section my section box is turned on so that's good. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Now this actually happens to be something else other than a, the site plan so if I really wanted to get rid of it at this point I could also right click on it, hide in view, and select elements. And now that's hidden. To get my section box visible, what I want to do is type in V space, brings up the view properties for this particular view. And in here, you notice that under extents of this view, I have a section box. And I'm going to go ahead and put a check on that and click OK. Notice that I have this box right here. And if I click on it, right away I get these triangles available for me to be able to control how far or where this particular section box is going to section off this model. So those are really similar to grips then? That's right. These are just like grips. So I can grab that and just bring it up to where I want it to be. Now I can look at my view cube and I just can click on, up here on the right side of the building then it brings me to this point where I can actually zoom in and use the triangles to really cut off maybe the the bottom of that building right there to be able to look from I don't know from this perspective to examine this building go back to my view cube and go to a ISO view of this and I'm going to go ahead and cut through this particular building all the way back here Using my zoom command, I zoom in here. And now I can look at this building a little bit better from a 3D view. So depending on depending on what you're interested in, as far as the mechanical room or the classrooms in here, and you want to see how uh, each piece is put together, I have control of the model in the 3D view to be able to focus in on parts of the building that I'm interested in. 
And this is really for viewing purposes to really just visualize this uh, building. If I was to go to drafting, I can do very few dimensions, but these are not, it's not the ideal place to be dimensioning. So you want to save that for your sections or your floor plan. The other thing I can do is select elements such as this wall right here. I can right click on it and say hide in view. I'm selecting more than that. Hold on. There we go. Hide element. Or if I wanted to hide a certain category, such as I don't want to see the doors, highlight that, right click, and hide categories. So I can actually hide all the doors in my project if I'm not interested in seeing those. To bring those back, and I can always, I can always click on the light bulb in my project, in, in the view down here. And this allows me to turn on a light bulb to see the things that I've turned off. And notice that I have the doors that are red and the walls that are red as well that are hidden in my view. So I can easily just select that. And I can either use the options bar up here at the top and click on unhide elements, or I can simply right click and uh, unhide in view. And right now, you notice that this is grayed out. It's because I have more than one thing selected. So I want to be careful of that. There we go. So only one item selected. I can just click on Unhide Elements. And now that's gone away, and it's actually a little, I don't know if you can tell over the internet, but that's gone back to gray. I can go back over here to my light bulb, and I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. So this is a way that I can turn off elements quickly, just like using the freeze command in AutoCAD. Once again, the view cube I can use to just fly through a, to a top view, rotate my building around if I want. Actually, rotate my view of the building. It's not the building. To rotate the building would be a, a very bad idea. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and just make this section box a little bigger. I want to see a little more of my building. And this is a fun way to explore and get to know your project, I think. And depending on the level of quality that you have, your 3D viewing experience will be a little bit faster or slower. So you want to keep that in mind as well. So to orbit, once again, is you have to hold down Shift and right click. And if I select an object in my model, I can hold down Shift and right click and actually spin around that particular object that I have selected. That keeps me centered a little bit so that I can focus in on that item. Okay, just to break in for just a second. Um Again, I want to remind everybody that this is going to be available later on our website. Um, I'm also keeping an eye on this, and uh, as far as um, I'm logged on, and some of the refresh rates are quite slow, so we're not quite seeing everything. So again, if you're if you don't have the best connection, we'll be able to download download this later. So don't worry. So now that we've played around with our 3D view, now we're ready to get the team going, and what we want to do is go ahead and print. So to do that, I would first close your 3D view and go to a simple view. So let's see under window, let's see if we have anything open. No, this is our only view. So what I'm going to do is bring back our project browser from the button right here. Click on that. I'm going to go ahead and double click on level one. 3D views do use a lot of processing power, so I would keep those closed. I'm just going to go ahead and close those hidden windows. 
So now to printing our project or to print our, should I say, architectural project to see exactly what we're at and how far we're going to be doing and what, get the team going, right? We're going to go ahead and click on File, pull down menu, and Print. Or obviously we can use Control-P or the button over here, multiple options, just like in AutoCAD or other programs. This brings up the print dialog box and here I first got to select the printer that I'm using. For uh, this particular example I'm going to use the QPDF writer. It's a free PDF maker. And after you have selected your printer what you want to go ahead and make sure that your settings for this printer are correct. So I'm going to move down here and go to setup. You want to make sure that you know what title block view this is. So I know that this is a 34 by uh, a 32 by 42 and that is a ARC E1 sheet for this particular printer. Here's where you determine whether this is centered or offset margins if you know what those are from the architect. I usually like to use center and if you're printing this to scale because you want to be able to actually take your ruler and measure out and uh, scale off the drawings you may want to make sure that this zoom is set to 100 percent. Then under vector processing faster is good so we're going to just select that one instead of the raster and it, it, there is a difference as far as the speed. Quality I haven't seen that big of a difference but maybe if you're doing higher quality prints which we usually don't get into it's more the architects where they get the beautiful beautiful plans and such. Uh, we're going to select here medium quality so that it goes a little faster for us and for the colors we're going to go ahead and select just black lines. One additional option besides the ones that we have here we're going to want to click the hide unreferenced view tags meaning any section call out that we have in our project that are not assigned to a sheet or have that information is actually not going to print so you don't get any empty callouts to uh, views. Now that we have these settings we're going to go ahead and hit save. So we save that as a default print or we can rename that and say that this is a arc E1 the paper size and full size plot. These settings stay with the project so I don't have to keep saving them. Now that we have these in here, we're going to go ahead and click OK. For the print range, we can print just the current view that we're in right now. I can print visible portions of the current view, meaning if I were to zoom into the mechanical room or some part of the building that I want to just print that out. Or my favorite one, which is select views and sheets. This one will allow me to actually print out multiple views and sheets at the same time. This is the equivalent of batch plotting in AutoCAD. Once I, once I select that, I just go ahead and have to make a selection of what views and sheets I want to print. Down here you'll notice that there's two boxes. There's the show sheets and, uh, and views. So. I'm going to be interested only the sheets because that's the ones that are really important that the architect is taking the time to actually create for me. So I'm going to uncheck the views. Notice that my list got a little bit shorter showing only the sheets. So if I'm interested in just let's say first floor, second floor and third floor, I'm going to go ahead and check those and at this point I can also just make a save of this selection and say floor plans. So a, a bit of point of reference, this would be a bit like the publish command. Yes. So the floor plans, can go ahead and click OK. Now that's saved with my project as well so that I can see right here anytime I go to print if my selection and floor plans, right away I know what those sheets or views are. So I have these selected here. Now notice that my preview button down here is actually grayed out. So what I need to do is to actually click on either current window or visible portion to be able to have the preview available for me. 
when you're printing multiple sheets, you're not going to see a preview of sheet to sheet to sheet. So when you're ready and you've done a test print before or you're familiar with how this is going to print, then you'll feel more comfortable to actually do a whole entire set. Therefore, you're not going to need a preview. So let's just click on uh, window, current window, just to be able to see what this preview looks like. I'm going to click on preview. And here's a print of this particular view. So it's not the sheet, it's just the view that I'm currently in. I can zoom in here and I can pan around using the scroll button, scroll on the, on the sides and top. Looks like I have everything in here that I need and want. And notice the section that we created earlier is not present in our plot right now because that's not, that's not uh, assigned to any sheet, therefore Revit didn't print it for me or have it available in this particular plot. So one thing that you want to uh, want to make sure you do when you're in print preview, instead of hitting close, close in print preview will actually close the printing session. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do is hit print. It's not going to print. It's going to take us back to the print menu to make further selections or changes that we want. So don't hit close because then we'll we'll be out of the printing dialog box. So let's go ahead and select our sheets now that we have a clear understanding of what we're printing and it looks pretty good. And after I have my settings correct here, I'm going to go ahead and just click OK. And now because I'm printing a PDF, it's going to take the time to pop up and you're not going to be able to see that, but it's going to pop up with a dialog box for me to save this file somewhere. It's going to actually pop up for each and every one of those sheets if I chose to save them individually. I could have saved uh, or created a PDF combining all of those, but I've selected just individual sheets. So, so that now that we have our plots, uh, we're ready to go and we're ready to get going with our projects. So uh, that pretty much concludes our basics to the Revit MEP and the building block as to how do we open it up, how do we view our model, how do we investigate and look to see some of these things. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to uh, open up maybe a Revit MEP model and show you that really quick as well in 3D. So we're going to go ahead and open. And I have this particular 3D view right here. This is taking to load. Uh, this is taking a little bit more to load because it's got a lot of the HVAC components in there. And more specifically, I'm actually opening directly into a camera view, 3D view. So it's a lot more intense. So this is another 3D view that we're able to create from uh, our floor plans. And I'll quickly show you that really uh, now, right is, here. Is this the time where everybody puts on their 3D glasses? Yes, yes. Put on your 3D glasses. Hopefully you kept them from Shrek <laughs> 3 or whatever. <laughs> so you can go to my HVAC uh, plan right here. Double click on my project browser. Notice now that I have electrical and uh, mechanical categories of views because this is an MEP project. This is the same architectural background and if I wanted to create a 3D view with the camera view let's say if you wanted to inspect or look at it what you can simply do is click on view new and you want to select camera view. Now I can go ahead and select my offsets in here or level one or uh, 
whether it's perspective or not for this view. And I want perspective view. That's a little fancier. So to create this, this camera view, I'm just going to click once to place where the camera is going to be. And then I'm going to drag my mouse out towards the items that I want to see within my camera view. And then I check again or click. And now the camera perspective 3D view is going to be created for me automatically. If you have a busy mechanical room or something fancy like that, you can create these views to be able to show, you know, how things look or maybe even put together a nice little presentation cover or something for your project. What I can do is grab these little dots or control points of my view and I can drag them around and make this beautiful 3D view as well of our work. And once again at the bottom I can change the quality of this. I can change this to a medium course. This allows me to switch a little bit faster and I can go to shading with edges so that I can see this a little better. So that's a quick way to create a perspective 3D view as well to be able to see your model. So that's neat. So that that concludes our portion of the Revit MEP presentation. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them up or uh, we're about to open up the phones to take any questions. But first, what we're going to do is go ahead and tell you about uh, our upcoming events. All right, well, Teo, that was great. Well, that's fantastic. Um, this isn't my background, so a lot of this is, is fun to watch. I'm, I'm kind of catching a lot of it with the other folks out there. So excellent stuff. I appreciate that. Uh, real quick, just a basically everything that Teo covered and, and a heck of a lot more. We do have our Revit MEP classes coming up up in Portland and in Seattle and you can see the dates there. Um, also <clears throat> we have some other events, free events coming up March 10th. We have Revit Architecture Test Drive down here in Portland and the following day up in Seattle. So I, I believe that's at lunch isn't it Teo? Yes. Yeah so come on out and check that out. And let's see here just finishing up here, um, we have our ABCs of Revit, of Revit on the March 12th. We're actually looking for topics. So at the at the end of this class, you're going to be, or I guess session, you're going to receive a an email that basically just kind of you know how do we do? Are, are we showing you what you need to be seeing? Um, there's a place for additional comments. And we would really appreciate it if you would fill those surveys out and get them back to us. Uh, we actually will uh, select one of those, and you'll win a Starbucks card. But in there, on that under that section, under the section for additional comments, please give us any topics that you can think of. Um, I'm speaking a little bit out of turn here, but if we select one of your topics, I'll make sure that we send you out a a, a Starbucks card as well. So that will be right after that. And then also on March 18th, we have a Navisworks webcast coming up. Uh, uh, it's part of the series, and it's from Scott Johnson. He does a great job. If you haven't checked that out, come go ahead and uh, log on, and let's take a look at that as well. And for additional resources, um, you can always get a hold of us. Um, of course, check out our website there. And then tech support, we mentioned that earlier. Um, if you have Revit MEP questions or you're running into a snag, you will be running into tail. So call in. We'll make sure he, we get back to you. We've included our phone number there. It's uh, You can see 877-PPI-GUYS. We thought that was rather clever. So go ahead and give us a holler on that. And then quickly at the end here, we're going to go ahead and open up the phones in just a moment. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute everybody. But just so everybody knows, there's our phone numbers for our Portland office and our Kent office. Uh, if you have any questions about today or uh, software or, for that matter, if you need us to come out and help you with any training or implementation up in our Seattle area or Kent slash Kent area, uh, that's where our office is. The folks that you're going to want to talk to up there are Brian Prisnell and also Jesse Thompson. 
Again, those are your account managers up in Seattle, Brian Presnell and Jesse Thompson. And then down here in Portland, uh, we'd have you contact Bo Kwan. And then if you have services that you're interested in, uh, again, it's completely scalable all the way from you know, plotting issues all the way up to a full implementation. You'd want to talk to our services manager down here in Portland, and that's Jorge Ocampo. So we're going to go ahead and open up the phones here. I'm going to unmute everybody, and don't be shy. Go, I, we haven't actually had any questions come across, typed across, so it looks like, Tao, you did a fantastic job there. So watch your ears here for just a second. All callers are muted. All callers are unmuted. All right, so now we can hear everybody. Um, did anybody have any questions about today or future topics? Charlie All right, so we'll have we'll have to kind of uh, sorry everyone because we uh, we don't have any way of of blocking seeing your hands. Out. Yeah, <laughs> seeing hands. So we'll start with you, Charlie. Yeah, just a point of observation. If we're going to get a fatal error, more than likely it happens when we're printing. Okay. In case anyone else experiences that. Tao, have you ran into that or? Uh, yeah, it happens depending on uh, the, the things that you're trying to print and the printer settings and such. Um, you might be making it uh, do more than it can or something. <laughs> what you might want to do yeah. on that is if you do get that message, uh, go ahead and refer back to that email. We can put it back up, the, the tech support email. Um, go ahead and give us a holler. Uh, what we would need is the exact message that you're getting yeah. or receiving, and that helps us kind of track down what's going on. So. Charlie, how big was your project that you were trying to print? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, it's a single floor building, but it's very large. Very large, okay. And were you trying to print one view at a time, or was it more than one view? No. Generally, when we just print one sheet, it's all right. It's when we print multiple sheets, and especially if we're printing something that's not full size, say, for instance, half size. Mm-hmm. And do you happen to remember what the quality settings, as far as whether it was coarse, medium, or fine? Do you medium. Remember? Medium. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Well, I'd be glad to look at that if you uh, want to go ahead and yeah. send me an email. And uh, yeah, on that one, that's going to be a little bit more of a tech support issue. So yeah. That, you know, why don't you give us a call offline on that one, Charlie, and we'll see if we can help you out. Okay. How yeah. about it? How about anybody Hi. else? Hello, this is uh, Scott at Interface Engineering. Hi, Scott. And, uh, I have a question. How you doing? Good, uh, good. This is a very good presentation. Um, we were wondering, when you have your sheets in the MVP, uh, can you group those so instead of, like, if we have a whole bunch of electrical, you don't have to scroll all the way down if there's just a way to get it to, uh, like, have like have, have you have the subcategories at the top for your views, if that's possible for your sheets as well? Yes, and you can. Uh, there's the project browser settings that you can actually define how those are actually organized. And at the same time, you can also uh, give each view a sub different subcategory so it groups those together as well. If you wanted to create a electrical uh, working uh, set and, of views, and it actually puts them all in that category and it'll keep them all together. Is it something we do in property? Uh, it's something that you do, let me see here if I can get back to my, can everybody see that now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so under settings, and I believe it's under, to do, what is it, um, project parameters, I'm trying to ref remember this, uh, no, 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 that's not, it's uh, trying to remember this uh, yeah right here it's project uh, browser organization right now it's grayed out for me so let me go to a floor plan view I think that's my number one thing that I need to be in so browser organization right here and I have different options available for me I can go by discipline uh, I can just do it by all or I can also create a new one if I wanted to and name it and Group it by different different uh, categories here. 
and I can create filters and such to be able to organize that the way that I want it to be. So I can even create a, a view for uh, electrical or whatnot. Or uh, It gives you a lot of flexibility. But one of my favorite ways to do it is to actually go to the view properties. So right now I'm in this current view. I type in uh, vSpace. And under sub-discipline right here, notice that that is uh, HVAC right here. I can say HVAC working. That's going to actually move it to a different subcategory other than, you notice that it used to be under HVAC. So I'm going to click OK. And that creates an additional, additional work set, or, or should I say group of views, and I am able to group those together with that particular group. So th there's a lot of flexibility, and you want to determine exactly how you want to do it. Okay? Does that help? Yes, yeah, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, this is Carmela from RJ. Hi, Carmela. Howdy. Um, let's see. If you're working with an existing model and you're building um, an HVAC system, with regard to workflow, is it best to start with um, uh, grills and output, or is it like better to start with the actual unit, the air conditioner, the heater, the VAV box, which... which is there like a, because I, I, I find sometimes it seems to give me less errors if I start one way or the other, depending on what the unit is. Well, there's and different. The draw ducks in between, but. Mm -hmm. but all, it all depends on how you're designing or how you like to work. Uh, I prefer to put in my diffusers first, and then okay. I put in my equipment, and then I go to the step of creating my systems where I select the diffuser, uh, start a system such as the supply system and then add the diffusers corresponding to that and the equipment and that allows me to go through the project and organize it by systems and such so it, it depends on how you like to work some people like to put in the equipment draw the duct and then put in the diffusers but it's all up to you uh, if you've experienced errors um, in different ways I'd love to uh, investigate investigate that a little more but um, I wonder why you're getting errors. You, the the timing that you put in the diffuser or the equipment is not as important as maybe the process of uh, doing your duct layout or your uh, uh, you know doing your duct work uh, piece by piece and such. But uh, I'd love to investigate that. So I think you have my email and feel free to email me with that. Okay. Does that does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Oh yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, everybody, I just want to chime in here real quick before we lose every anybody um, or too many more folks. Um, on the tech support side, uh, right now we're offering uh, our own little stimulus plan. Um, normally, the tech support program is four ninety five, and we're throwing in a voucher right now for two hundred bucks. So it's an annual fee, and it would be two hundred ninety five dollars um, after the the voucher. So just want to let everybody know so there's no confusion in case they were to call in. Does that mean we get a deduction on what we've already purchased? Um, that I don't know. You'd have to talk to the sales folks on that one. <laughs> we're, we're just have guns, we'll travel. I just figured I got to thinking about that, and I didn't want to send the wrong message. So, but but thank you, everyone. Is there any other questions? We're gonna we're starting to run just a bit long here. Any, any other quick questions? Uh, just one. Okay. Um, might like a quick command be a subject for um, an upcoming webcast? Okay. That would be great. Like uh, two key commands? Is that what you're referring to? Like two key shortcuts? Yeah, those things. Okay. I, I don't know any of those. Okay, we could take a look at that. And then also, like I said, folks, um, if you don't mind, fill out those surveys that will be sent to you and then get those back. And that actually helps us out tremendously. Uh, and, and also, like I said, it gives you the ability if you can, you know, after we get off the webcast here, you might think of another topic. So anything that pops in your head, please throw it in there. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks One so much. One last question. Okay. Uh, the machine you're using down there, is that a 32 or 64-bit processor? 
Ooh, good question. Yeah, good question. I'm using a 32-bit right now. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're very welcome. Anybody else? All right, everybody. Well, I think that's going to conclude for today. We'll, we'll hopefully you'll all tune in for the next one, and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it.